Thank you, Heather. It's good to be back. Thank you, Henry. It is good to be back. You people have given a brand new view of the term valet parking out here. <laughs> I, I drove in and saw the tape out here and I thought that somebody had actually heard the presentation before I had given it and was <laughs> warning people off. It is fantastic to be back here. I, I, I speak all over the country and I tell people that I, I've never been treated as good living in the lap of luxury down at the Intercontinental. Uh, everybody here from Willie who takes care of me when I come in to the people. Yes, by all means. I was just thinking when we first came in, he remembered every single thing that I needed from the last time and stuff that I had forgotten to do and bring in. The people at the Kauffman Foundation, I have a lot of fun on KCUR. It's just really, really good to be back. Henry is correct. I am from real upstate New York. Living on Long Island, the people in New York City, they live in their own little universe and anything north of Manhattan is Siberia to these folks. I mean, they have no conception of what it really, really looks like. This was back in December, by the way. Um, my office is the one that's going to have the icicles falling down on it there at some point. But I wasn't really sure that I was going to get back here because, what was it, on December 22nd or something? Wasn't the world supposed to end? or the Mayan calendar, so I wasn't sure whether I should even sign up for duty here or not. Girls gone wild. <laughs> I love this picture. I don't know why Senator Clinton isn't participating in this here. But somebody really, and this was, I, I don't know when this picture was taken. I found it and I just loved it, so I'm sticking it up here. Um, it, it almost looks like Barbara Bush is trying to get away, uh, like, like Rosalind Carter is trying to grab everybody and keep them staying. This is a new area of scholarship. It's what we call East Wing Studies. I was brought into East Wing Studies, Studies of the First Lady, accidentally and almost as an act of egotism. I worked under the incredibly mistaken assumption that because I'd written three books on Gerald Ford, I'd be able to write a good book quickly on Betty Ford, who I had met a, a couple of times. That didn't turn out to be true by a long shot. East Wing Studies is a complicated, new, value-rich in terms of the archives branch of American history. University of Kansas Press that I'm pleased to be a part of has published the seminal series on the First Ladies, the modern First Ladies series, beginning with Helen Taft. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt is in the works right now and working its way through to Mrs. Clinton and I believe that uh, Laura Bush has been assigned. The depth of the research here shows that this new literature is both finding a home and a place in the intellectual world. Of course, the best book in this series. <laughs> There's absolutely no question about it, says, says my mother. And I want you to remember as you get your checkbooks out and you buy this book out here that I just graduated a kid from law school who's studying for the bar and is incredibly unemployed. So I need all the help that I can get. <laughs> Somebody start me with a question about Betty Ford. Come on, don't be shy. I'm telling this crowd not to be shy. What influence did she have on her husband? More influence on her husband after she went through recovery than when she was first lady. Her politics did not affect her husband specifically during the presidency, 
because there was a wall, and that wall was two people, Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, both working in the White House at the time, who essentially kept her politics separate from the president's. I'm gonna talk in a moment about how that had a lot to do with President Ford's loss in 1976. That's a good question. Anybody else got one? Another excellent question, her initial uh, addiction, or her initial illness is not very well known. It was debilitating arthritis. And she had that diagnosed while she was a dancer with the Martha Graham Dance Troupe in New York City. Then she masked it with pills, the alcohol mixed with it, and we, most of us know the rest of the story. But the family is very tied into uh, the American Arthritis Association. Betty Ford had three incurable diseases, alcoholism and addiction to pain uh, killers and debilitating arthritis at the time of her death. And she was absolutely clear it was the arthritis that caused her the most pain. I just thought I'd start out with that. Form your questions. Um, if you turn your questions at the end into speeches, Crosby's going to have to give you a speaker's fee. So we'll keep the questions short. There's a cute kid. Born in Chicago, and she was born in 1919. Elizabeth Ann Bloomer, her family moved her to Grand Rapids, Michigan, the heart of middle America, through the Depression. Her father, Bill Bloomer, was a traveling salesman, sold rubber from Goodyear Tire to other tire manufacturers throughout what we now know as the Rust Belt. Her mother, Hortense Bloomer, was a, a society doyenne in Grand Rapids and hoped that her daughter would follow in her directions and marry wealth and settle down and be a society matron. <laughs> Look how that turned out. First crisis, Bill Bloomer, a traveling salesman, dies very suspiciously. He dies while his car is running in the garage of carbon monoxide poisoning. I found his death certificate um, in my research and it said it was accidental, but people around Grand Rapids still talk about Bill Bloomer's death. It was a possible suicide. The reason that they say that is because outside of the fact that young Betty Bloomer learned of her father's death, and it certainly shattered her. At his funeral, her mother told her for the first time that Bill Bloomer was an alcoholic, and that she had gone out on the road over the years, told Betty that she was joining him out on the road, but what she was really doing was going out and pulling him out of various gutters, ditches, and tough scrapes. So one of the things that I had to deal with, and I'm sure that there are people here that are more knowledgeable about this than I, was the nature versus nurture argument. Was Betty Ford born an alcoholic? Or was alcoholism, in the, in the terms that are used, to, was it catching? Was this something that she was high risk for because of her father? Well, you start out with that, and she tells you that she took her first drink at age 14 because she was a wild child. Betty Ford was a wild child. She, this, is, this is her sorority picture for a sorority in Grand Rapids called the Good Friends. They smoked, they drank, they partied, they were hell raisers, and they drove their parents crazy. I mean, apparently that happened then, too. <laughs> of course not now, and never in Kansas City. <laughs> what s calmed Betty down and what gave her direction was dance. The chapter that I have in this very good book that you can buy when you go out, the chapter on her early years I called Dancer. I'd, I'd like to point out a couple of things, and this is not, this is not meant to be a joke. Look, look at the legs on her, look at the thighs. This, this is an athlete as she grew up. She fell into dance. Her mother thought that it would give her the grace and poise necessary to catch a rich husband. What she did was she landed a love for the dance 
that led her to ask her mother the million dollar thing that all parents are afraid of, I want to go to New York. I want to go to New York City and I want to study dance. And mom came up with a compromise solution. Instead of going to New York, there's a great dance program at Middlebury College in Vermont. And Middlebury then and now, or Bennington, I'm sorry, Bennington uh, then and now, a very progressive school, no grades given out at this time, and you got to study dance and you weren't going to New York City. Betty said, fine. She went up and for two years, this is Betty Ford here, I'm sorry, Betty Bloomer here, and she went up and she studied at Bennington College and she met, and those of you who are, have gone through college or the educational system know that there's, my, my general rule of thumb is there's always a teacher. There's somebody who touches you and says this is the direction to go. For Betty Bloomer, it was Martha Graham. The seminal ground zero person for modern dance in the 20th century in the United States and some would say the world. Graham spent two summers teaching in Vermont. Betty was lucky enough to be able to afford her class. It was $12 a summer. She paid the $12 and Martha Graham taught her discipline, taught her a love for the dance, and taught her a professional love for the dance. So that when Martha went back to New York, Betty said to her mother, I can join the Martha Graham dance troupe if you'll let me go. Her mother said yes, and Betty, Betty joined the Martha Graham dance troupe, but she never made the final cut. She never made the cut for the traveling troupe around the country. She was in a troupe that stayed and only performed once a month at the Lincoln Center, before the Lincoln Center was the Lincoln Center. This is Betty Bloomer in the middle in Martha Graham's Metamorphosis, performing as part of the Manhattan-based Martha Graham troupe. Betty didn't make the final cut because she was still too much of a partier, still too much of a good time, and Martha could never settle her down. And so eventually there was a parting of the ways. And Betty came back to Grand Rapids. She came back to Grand Rapids, however, not as a society doyenne, but as a professional woman who held two jobs in an era when holding one job was virtually unheard of. Her first was as a dance teacher. She went back to Calla Travis's uh, dance academy, signed up as a teacher, and was almost run out of town for accepting black students, black children, into her classes. Her second job was at, and every time I say this, I don't, I don't, it just sounds funny, Herpelsheimer's. Herpelsheimer's department store. You remember department stores? I don't think they exist anymore. This is Herpelsheimer's in Grand Rapids, and Betty Ford was a fashion buyer. She went all over the East Coast, bringing back the latest in New York City fashion to a cosmopolitan area of Grand Rapids that wanted it. It's not surprising that when Betty Ford first married, her first marriage was to a traveling salesman, just like her father, Bill Warren who was also an alcoholic. I also found evidence, evidence that didn't please some people, but you know, you don't hide history, that he was an abusive husband as well. After nine years of traveling throughout the Northeast, following Bill Warren around, Betty divorces him in what she calls in her memoirs her nine-year mistake. And then she ends the chapter saying, I'd never marry again. Gerald Ford was one of the best known people in Grand Rapids. He had been a football star. He had gone to the University of Michigan. He had gotten his law degree at Yale. He was drafted by both the Chicago Bears and the Green Bay Packers, 
another star that the Kansas City Chiefs missed. <laughs> you can't boo me, I'm a tourist. <laughs> Went and served valiantly in World War II, and then came home, parlayed his, uh, as, as many men did, Richard Nixon, John F. Kennedy, and others parlayed his veteran status into a political career but he couldn't marry Betty until he had gotten through his first primary election. She was a divorcee, and he was not willing to risk marrying her until he had beaten the Republican candidate in the primary, which was tantamount to election. So on October 15, 1948, just a few weeks before an election that he now knew that he was going to win, Betty Bloomer Warren and Gerald Rudolph Ford Jr. are married. The story of what happened to Betty Ford that we are familiar with, a story of addiction and recovery, has its roots in the life that she was taken out of, the life of a businesswoman and a teacher and the life that she was put into, the trophy wife of an up-and-coming national politician. She was not ready for it, and she did not handle the transition particularly well, and neither did the president. These are pictures that were taken in 1952. They need no explanation. They're from a 1952 campaign book. Look at what we want people to believe. It was right about at this time that a number of things happened to Betty. The first is she tries. She tries very, very hard to fit the mold of the congressional wife. She was very proud of the fact that she, took, that she studied one bill from Congress. And in, in something that we now make sixth graders do or seventh graders do, followed that bill all the way through to passage so she would know what her husband was doing, what her husband was doing. So you think of the transition of going from a national buyer to this. He was never home. He was on the road close to 300 days a year because one of Gerald Ford's, uh, the things that, he, that made him Gerald Ford and the minority leader was the fact that he was a prodigious fundraiser who was liked on both sides of the aisle. Everybody wanted this guy to speak. I mean, you, you, could just, you can tell by listening to President Ford, you know, he could hold an audience. So he's on the road an awful lot. She hurts her arm and her elbow in an accident with a renegade window in their Alexandria home that comes crashing down on her arm. She starts taking prescription painkillers, by her own admission begins to take painkillers, mixing them with alcohol. She finds out that she does have arthritis in her hand. If you meet Betty Ford at any point in time during her public career when she shakes her hand, she shook it like this because there was often that pain there. Everything started going together and before 1965, 1966, Betty was showing full signs of alcoholism and it was being hidden both by the family and by the party itself because Gerald Ford was on the fast track. We know these pictures. We know what was happening. Nobody wanted Carl Albert to be vice anything. You went with the guy who was going to be confirmed after Spiro Agnew stepped down because of one of the dumbest scandals in American history, taking money in a paper bag in a parking lot in Baltimore, Maryland. And we know how it ended out. Again, by her own admissions in her memoirs, Betty wrote that she was virtually incoherent inebriated the day that President Ford was sworn in. So now there's a new spotlight. A lot of women, as I read through the literature that my friends have written on in East Wing Studies, this is the point in time when a lot of women being thrust into the spotlight for the first time, I mean, maybe they had been the wife of a governor, 
or the wife of a cabinet member like Nellie Taft, the wife of a governor like Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of a senator like Jackie Kennedy or Lyndon Johnson. You take Betty Ford and you put her back into the spotlight. That was where she belonged. That was what she had been trained to do. She was a teacher. She was a dancer. You put a spotlight on this woman and she flourished. So one of the stories about Betty Ford that tells us an awful lot is that when she gets into the White House, she does something that first ladies don't normally do. She blossoms. She's on a stage. And this blossoming, what I call you know, candor and courage in the White House, that wasn't just a throwaway line to make a good title for a book. It's got great alliteration. And it looks great on a cover. But it's also absolutely true. I can break down Betty Ford's assets. And the other part of first lady literature is that not all first ladies are assets. A lot of first ladies are debits that the White House staff and the president has to learn how to deal with. But not Betty Ford. She brought four unique assets. And the first and the best known is her personal courage. This was one of two pictures that was taken only hours after Betty Ford's radical mastectomy on September 28, 1974. She learned that she had a lump and had her breast removed in the space of 72 hours. This is a picture that Betty Ford demanded be taken. Gerald Ford, he told me this, was just obliterated personally by all of this. You know, he was just broken down, and he wanted you know, to close the doors to the hospital and let her recover. And she said, no. Let them see this. What happens after this is that Betty Ford becomes the first celebrity spokesperson for breast self-examination in an era when she was getting hate mail that I've read for going out and talking about women's bodies in public. There was only one other. Here's a trivia question for you. One other celebrity had lost a breast to radical mastectomy only two months before Betty did, but she refused to talk about it. Who was that? Happy no, Happy Rockefeller It was right afterwards. Very good, but no. Shirley Temple Black. And she lost a breast but refused to go out and talk about it. Betty took it on not just as a challenge but as something that she was literally trained to do as a teacher. Once she got that stage after her mastectomy, she began to speak out about her arthritis we kind of missed that, I found out as I was looking back at some of the press. She told people she had arthritis, that she couldn't move. We all knew that. There was like a mention about it in People magazine. By the way, then and now, Betty Ford is the second person who has had the most covers in People magazine history. They couldn't get enough of her during this period. She worked for the Arthritis Foundation and spoke out. Apropos of nothing that I've said before, this is one of my favorite stories about courage. This was during the 1976 campaign. You might recognize Senator Warner, Mr. Elizabeth Taylor. All right. And this was at a fundraiser at the New York Hilton. And what's happening behind her is that the rabbi who gave the invocation has just dropped over with a heart attack. The place is going, you know, nuts because it wasn't, it, I've seen this on video, he just goes back like this. It's Betty who gets up and talks to the crowd, has them sit down and leads them in a prayer. Then she gets in the ambulance, goes with this guy, and he dies in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. You can also throw in personal courage for two assassination attempts on her husband, grace and style. It is certainly and it's public courage. This is in front of a microphone. The second asset is more difficult 
to quantify. And it's not political skill, it's not being a politician, it's political insight more than anything else. One of the things that I found, and more interviewees told me this than anything else, was that it was Betty who went to him and said, you've got to pardon him and you've got to pardon him now. Gerald Ford's problem with the pardon was not the pardon itself. It was the timing of the pardon and the fact that I should probably dance. <laughs> Music applied. The fact that the pardon was done so soon it was Betty who said, you can ride it out. It's done, and I put the dates on here to remind you of something that I'm sure that you all know, how fast the pardon was done after Gerald Ford took the presidency over. It was Betty who talked him into it, and everybody in the White House, Dick Cheney, Don Rumsfeld, Bob Hartman, Nelson Rockefeller, saying that you've got to wait. She turned out to be right, but not right away. Good politicians know that you really, you're, whether you're right or wrong, it's proven years after you're out of office. No, the Equal Rights Amendment was not passed. But that should not blind us to the fact that this is the first First Lady, not Eleanor Roosevelt, the first First Lady to actively lobby Congress for a bill. Now, Lady Bird Johnson pushed very, very hard for the Beautification Act that led to the limitation of billboards on America's highways. Look where that's gotten us. Just driving in from the airport here in Kansas City, it's like one big billboard. The, this, this one, instead of what Mrs. Johnson did, which was to very privately through the staff go, she called congressmen. She called them at home. She woke them up. She called state legislatures. Yes, it was failed, but this is where Hillary Clinton comes from. This is where the belief that you can have an active part in policy comes from. From Betty Ford's work on the ERA, not its failed passage. Her third asset was that this woman made love to a camera like nobody's business. She was the first First Lady to hold a full press conference since, and this stunned me, Mamie Eisenhower, who did one and then never did it again. Everybody remembers what she said on 60 Minutes, that she was certain that her kids had tried marijuana and that her daughter, Susan, probably had an extramarital affair. Can you imagine being Susan and hearing this? <laughs> What nobody thinks about is that they offered her the interview and she said yes. And she's an alcoholic. And she's an alcoholic in the White House. She says in her memoirs, the only way she got in front of this camera was to have four or five drinks. She knew that even in that condition that she could control the camera, and she did. Take issue with what she had to say. It was, not, it was a moment that drove the White House crazy. But this is a first lady given an interview to one of the most suave and sneaky types of interviews. It would kill you with niceness, and morally safer. And she comes out on top. And she becomes the first first lady to appear on a situation comedy. This is actually an important moment, and I'll talk more about it in a second. In January of 1976, as the president began his re-election campaign, not against Jimmy Carter, but against Ronald Reagan, who was running from the right to capture the nomination from him in the last really great convention held right here in Kansas City. This was a serious problem for the Ford administration. In 1976, Time Magazine rated the most feminist women in the world. Number one was Mary Tyler Moore. 
Number two was Betty Ford. Neither one were feminists. Neither one of them. Betty Ford writes consistently that her desire was not to break away from the traditional family role. She didn't want to be called a feminist. And Mary Tyler Moore's shows now, as you look back at them, were almost deceptively innocent. But the White House had a problem. Where they made up for it was the fact that this woman was fun. She would push her husband into a pool in front of the White House press corps and just for good measure kick in the dog too. <laughs> okay, who's this? Come on. Very good, Marty Allen. The dancer. This was a Ford White House party. Because of this, going into the election, Betty was initially seen to be an asset. By the way, if you've ever been to New Hampshire, the guy on the right, that's a typical guy from New Hampshire. <laughs> it didn't stick However, because the White House didn't know how to use her, what they did was they put the president in the White House, told him not to campaign, and told him to look presidential. That's what beat Ronald Reagan. But Jimmy Carter, going out to virtually every state in the Union, was able to beat Jerry Ford at his own game. He was so hoarse from campaigning the night of the election. They had just learned that Carter had beaten them, went to the Oval Office, and Ford said, I want a picture. And they were all crying. And it's Mrs. Ford who's about in her hand to read his concession speech, who is making everyone that's, uh, I think that's Mike. I get them confused. They look so much alike I've met them, but I think that's Mike Ford who she has there. Um, buck up, if you will. Besides, she was happy. I am out of the White House, let me out of here, I'm going to California. This was the day before Carter's inauguration. She took off her shoes and had David Hume Kennerly, the White House photographer, show her boogie in the cabinet room on top of the table. <laughs> this is her favorite picture. Gerald Ford hated it. <laughs> she goes back to California to write her memoirs. They're all available here in the library, but be careful with them. Because The Times of My Life, her first volume, is before she was honest with the American public about her addiction. The last chapter's in here, she's literally lying. A Glad Awakening, in the introduction, she says, I have to come clean. I have to fix this. I have to fix the record. And so you read, must read them in tandem. It is two years after Betty Ford leaves the White House that the family has an intervention. It's led by her daughter, Susan. Gerald Ford comes home. He'd gone out on the road. He went back out on the rubber chicken circuit. He wanted to run for president again in 1980. He was gearing up for a run. She was alone once again. The drinking increased to the point where uh, her only in-law daughter, uh, I'm blanking on her name, her only, her only in-law, daughter-in-law, said, I do not want you around my children. They had an intervention. She went to Long Beach, one of the premier places at the time, and came out clean and mad. She was mad at her disease. That's why she writes in the times of her life. And she finds herself once again, she remakes herself as a fundraiser. And to get back to this good lady's question right at the beginning, this is where they remake their relationship. Because with Bob and Dolores Hope, the Fords raised money for what we now know as the Betty Ford Center. She never wanted her name on it. Because she says, what if, what if I fail? What if I go back? I'm an alcoholic. What if I relapse? And Gerald Ford said, I'll tell you this, if you don't put your name on it, I ain't raising any money. 
So it became the Betty Ford Center. And I write in my book, I said, this is, this is a woman who we know of as almost a noun. Where are you going? I'm going to Betty Ford. That's a singular accomplishment for anybody who's ever had to raise dollar one for anything. In 2007, President Ford passed away. In July 2001, Betty Ford passed away. And as I was sitting in MSNBC and I was asked this question on the air, and I was asked to assess Mrs. Ford's impact, I said that it must be seen as, not as a first lady uniquely, but as a public health advocate. As a person who, anyone who is, who is been seriously ill, has to think about what would happen if they were called upon to talk about that illness on national television, to describe what had happened to them in the hospital, to put up graphs, as she did, about her breast surgery. If you had something severe happen to you, would you want the world to know? This woman demanded that the world know. Not only about that, but about her arthritis, about her pain killers, and about her failures. This is a woman who was not afraid to say, I failed and tried again. Her lasting impact is as that public health advocate, and oh yeah, she was married to a president of the United States. I don't know who wrote this, maybe I did, I, um, <laughs> but I thoroughly believe it. Oh, thank you. <laughs>